Hello and welcome to the Gifted Ed Podcast. We're grateful for the opportunity to share this space with you today as we go into the trenches with two teachers in the field of gifted education. In a recent episode, we explored the differences between introverted and extroverted students. This is Jim Leash. Jim has over 30 years of experience teaching children in math, science, and drama. It almost comes down to like taking the temperature of the room in the moment and figuring out who's where in their mental kind of capacity. Seeing students in a wide variety of contexts has given him insight into the ways that teachers can learn about each student as a whole child. By ensuring that students feel seen, known, and valued, teachers provide the best possible environment for their learning and growth. And a lot of that too comes down to like personal connections. I give them permission to step back and do what they need to do, even if it's just a look, a glance, a laugh, something like that. We also spoke with Jeff Westbrook, currently a first through eighth drama teacher. Jeff has 34 years of teaching experience in elementary and high schools. He has developed interest and insight into exploring how to teach students with varying personalities and proclivities, including those for whom drama and performance is not an immediate or obvious fit. I I think the overall goal is to create as many opportunities as we can within our curriculum and what we're trying to do that would appeal to an introvert or an extrovert. And then when we can't do that, look for opportunities where choices can be involved. Jeff's curricular focus is on cultivating student work in playwriting, acting, and design. And he looks for opportunities to give students so that all of them find an area in which they can flourish. The extrovert may have a naturally loud, boisterous personality and enjoy doing that on stage. But the introvert may have really skilled observation techniques that allow them to change into that character. Teaching, while being mindful of both introverted and extroverted personality types, presents some unique challenges within the gifted population. From classroom participation to collaborative group work, the constant stimulation of the school environment and relentless pressure to perform can be mentally exhausting. As a teacher, you tend to see the various ways in which children interact with you and and with your lessons and with each other. So after a very short amount of time, your extreme extroverts and your extreme introverts become fairly straightforward. You can can see it. Um, So you spend some time in those situations making sure that... um, the extroverts get those like hands-on experiences. They get they get the the socialization piece, but at the same time, then you have to figure out while the, while the extroverts are being served, what are you doing with the introverts? How are the introverts getting included into the um, into the lesson? So, a lot of what I do is I try to change modalities frequently over the course of a lesson. So there's something that there's something that's more discussion oriented, followed by something that's more either like individual uh, problem solving or maybe small group problem solving um, so that each group has some time. Um, I try to always mix in some me at the board time because that's that gives the the whole class that chance to kind of reflect at their own levels. And um, the hard part, the hard part there is sometimes uh, making sure that the extroverts who can sometimes feel just absolutely fine, like launching into the middle of those conversations, which can make it kind of choppy. And if you're trying to observe as an introvert, it can be very disconnected and disjoint experience. But so those are the extremes. I like what you said in terms of the extremes because that implies that there's a continuum in oh, between. Absolutely. Yeah. And how do how do you address that? That's much harder um, because it, it's 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 both a spectrum, and you have students who, at various points, even from minute to minute, might express themselves more in, in a more introverted fashion versus a more extroverted fashion. I myself, like, there are days when you'll see me in the classroom and you'll see this the actor person of me being out there and and visible. And then there are other times where you'll see me kind of like, I just need time alone to figure out my life or figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> so so it's it's the kids in the middle that you really have to pay very close attention to and try and balance. It's It almost comes down to like taking the temperature of the room in the moment and figuring out who's where in their mental 
kind of capacity and trying to tailor on the fly like, okay, is now a time to step back and let them work by themselves or should I push forward and do some more direct instruction? I feel like m- the fact that you can model both um, bo- characteristics of both is probably empowering for students who might either be extremes or might waver themselves, that, that they see a teacher who models both pieces as well and that they can see themselves and like give, it almost gives the permission, right? That both ways are acceptable and work in this classroom. Yeah, no. And, and, and a lot of that too comes down to like personal connections. Like with the introvert, when I'm doing something that's more extrovert friendly, just acknowledging the introvert's presence, making sure that I make personal contact with them, I, I, I give them permission to step back and do what they need to do, even if it's just a look, a glance, a laugh, something like that. I was just thinking about what you said in terms of the temperature of the room, and I think you hit on a really important part about being a teacher is the power of observation and, and how that observation can help you differentiate your instruction yeah. in that sense. Absolutely. And style. Absolutely. And, 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 it, and it, it really is <laughs> – the hard part there is that a lot of times what the observation tells you is, is that what you're doing isn't working. <laughs> so <laughs> – powerful. <laughs> which, 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 which is great data. It's fantastic data. But, but then you have to figure out in the moment what you're going to do. And then you have to like, a lot of times I'm, I'm there like, okay, my goals are not going to be met because I planned this lesson this way. And it seems that my class needed something different. So then what am I going to do to allow my students to engage where they are and then figure out how to pick up the pieces later? So can you give us an example of how you do that? It's hard. Because a lot of times, particularly like as a math teacher, you have a curriculum that you already feel is too much for the amount of time you have in a year to, to, to pursue it. So, But you have to let some of that go. And you have to say, okay, what are the absolute crucial skills, crucial concepts? Everything else at this point is going to have to take a back seat. So it may be, as, it may be something like shutting down what's going on, starting over, And then knowing that, okay, well, what I thought I might be able to accomplish in a 45-minute class period, now it's probably going to be more like two 45-minute class periods. Um, Many times in the past, I would fall into the mistake of like, I've got to get through this today. I'm just going to push through and whatever happens, happens. And then, of course, that's self-defeating, right? Because nothing really happens. And then you wind up later on knowing as you go to assess the learning that it wasn't really there. You missed that. (laughs) window. Right. Yeah. Right. I was just going to say, I think your students really appreciate that flexibility. It, 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 is, it is a balancing match though, too, because, you know, I teach middle school students and middle school students also can be very keyed into like, they know me and they know how distractible I can be sometimes. And they know how to send me <laughs> signals. This is where the extroverts, this is where the extroverts really come in to play because they're very socially attuned to each other and to me. And so they can be like, if, if, if we do this, and I'm not even sure it's always conscious. It may just be like, if we do this, we can buy ourselves a little bit of breathing time and then things will slow down. And sometimes that's actually a good signal. I need to slow down. Yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, a 12-year-old being a 12-year-old and not wanting to have as much work on their plate. So it's, it's, it's an art more than a science. <laughs> Uh, how do you provide introverts with more agency to demonstrate what they've learned, just not in a group setting? Yeah, that's that's really hard. I try as much as possible not to call on people who are exhibiting ex- introvert traits, kind of cold calling, um, largely because it's rare in those cases, particularly at a school like this where the kids are already so internally motivated, yeah. it's rare that they've checked out. It's not like they're they're like not really participating. It's just that they are not comfortable with whatever the energy would take to push themselves out in front of the room. So I try to do as much written reflection as possible in those situations. Let the kids write out their thoughts and then we can talk about it individually. I go in and check on them personally. If it's particularly if it's problem solving time, I can go in and ask one on one questions. Um, and then every now and then I'll ask permission. Like, hey, can I call on you for this just because I think you had something important to say um, and, ask, and kind of give them the agency to be like and – if, and if they say no, I'm like, okay, well, 
I'm going to ask you to let me know if that changes, and then I'll try and find some other way to get your thoughts up onto the board. And sometimes I'll, I'll be like their voice. I noticed that this student was doing something like this, and I thought this was really interesting. And so I will sort of translate it to, to the class for them. It's, it's almost like a scaffold, like trying to find that scaffolding piece. I know in our uh, previous episode, we kind of talked about how sometimes introverts look disengaged, look like they don't care what's going on, you know, all these kind of negative assumptions that one can make based on how they're physically presenting. So I think the fact that you go out of your way to give the individual attention and then use it as a model to the class just really changes the experience of an introvert within your math class. Yeah. And you always have in your mind, like, is this an introverted moment or is this an executive functioning Mm -hmm. problem? And sometimes it takes time to understand the kid. And that's where you really, like, that's why working at a school where you have class sizes where I I know how prone a student is to executive functioning problems. So I can more accurately gauge if they're just re-energizing or if they have fully disengaged. Again, I think it's that power of observation. Yeah. Right? Because you know your students. Yeah. Yeah. And I have that luxury because I don't have 30 in a room at a time and I'm not, my, my attention is not being parsed, you know, a minute and a half per kid per lesson. We would like to thank Jim for his time, passion, and expertise. Getting to work with exceptional children has enriched his appreciation for the wide variety of talents and gifts that children bring to school. And he is passionate about helping them see the fullness of their potential across all parts of their lives. Next, you will hear our conversation with first through eighth drama teacher, Jeff Westbrook, as he expands on the importance of recognizing and providing opportunities for both introverted and extroverted students. I think, obviously, extroverts are are gaining their strength from being with other people. Uh, so they can really get into the acting exercises. Uh, they can really get into any kind of group work. Uh, whether it's rehearsing on a scene with a partner or working on a play with a whole group of people or a movie, uh, they tend to do very well in those circumstances because uh, you know they're they're gaining energy from from being with those other people. Uh, for introverts, they can sometimes be quiet in class, although not necessarily. It's not nece- a necessary correlation between introversion and extroversion. Uh, they can be a little bit more intimidated as the groups get larger for working on a movie or a production. So it, it can be challenging in that sense. Uh, but introverts also have some strengths that really help them out in drama class uh, because they tend to be a more thoughtful, reflective people. That oftentimes helps them create characters. Uh, introverts are usually better observers. It's just a natural skill they have. So when when you're asking them to pretend to be something they're not, they have more resources to pull on. Obviously, they're more comfortable with the playwriting aspect of it, which is usually a person being alone in a room generating ideas. And this is something that extroverts, you know, just by personality would struggle with a little bit more. Um, So obviously, although drama is a very specialized activity, uh, there are parts of it that are natural fits for a extroverted person and there are other parts of it that are a natural fit to an introverted person. Well, and I'm thinking too through the variety of activities, right? Because you mentioned Mm -hmm. playwriting Mm -hmm. and then you have the actual performance Mm -hmm. of the characters, but then there's lighting, Mm -hmm. there's the behind the stage. Right. So at first, initially, when I was thinking through drama, I really just thought, gosh, this is a great place for extroverts. Mm -hmm. But thinking of it now, as you talk about character development and playwriting, you really can do both and and have that the students feel like they have equal value, that they're both putting forth equal parts to the whole process. Right. And I also think it's very important to note that um, a big part of introversion is simply recharging your batteries by being alone. Right. But there are many introverts who really enjoy performance, being in public. Um, Steve Martin, the original wild and crazy guy, is an mm-hmm. introvert. Yeah. You know, And uh, so there are a lot of people that like putting themselves out there as long as they're going to have some quiet, alone time to recharge. Yeah. 
Uh, so that's one of the things when, I, when we're dealing with this, this is one of the things I talk to the students about early on, that some people are introverted, some people are extroverted. We talk about what that means. And of course, it's on a spectrum. Some people might be halfway in between. Right. But we talk about how that impacts because I think there is a common misunderstanding that all actors are extroverts. Yeah. And all playwrights are introverts. Thank you for that. <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't really work like that. Yeah. I mean, you're going to find probably you'll find more introverts that are playwrights and probably more extroverts that are actors. But it's, it's um, sometimes I, I worry that we might limit ourselves yeah. uh, by a personality trait when there's actually in that area, there's world, there's room for everyone. It can become and, very rigid. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing different strengths to it. Right. Like I said, the extrovert may have a naturally loud, boisterous personality and enjoy doing that on stage, but the introvert may have really skilled observation techniques that allow them to change into that character. Right. So I guess as you're speaking, I'm wondering about this question, um, being that introverts have their own challenges and extroverts have their own challenges within the drama process. Um, I'm sure tensions can arise. Mm -hmm. um, and what do those tensions look like when they're working within a group? And how do you support them to work through that? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I do think the whole school day is built for extroverts, obviously. That's part of the issue. For us adults who work at school, we have planning periods. We have, you know, different times in the day when we can take a break and we can be quiet and we can be alone if we need to. Um, kids don't really get that option very much. So I think one thing we can do is, um, if it fits the curriculum and fits what we're doing that day, I think teach, as teachers, we can give them some quiet times within the class. Maybe we're giving them some quiet time to work on an assignment or to do some writing or reflection. Mm -hmm. All these things are, are real natural fits for introverts. So if we inc can incorporate some practices within the school day, then we can try to create a few moments of quiet and stillness for them. I think, I think whenever we can take that opportunity, it's good. Uh, at the same time, introverts can act like extroverts when the need arises. And part of what we can do as a school is help train them. When you need to act like an extrovert, this is how you can do it. Just like, and, and, and of course, once they go home, the situation is kind of flipped. Because homework is the ideal world for the introvert yeah. and real challenge for the extrovert. So I do think if you look at school as a whole, including the home piece, it doesn't look quite so bad for the introverts because the extroverts have their own challenge. Can they sit down alone by themselves and work on their homework? Because that's going to be very draining for, for an extrovert. You know, they don't want to do that. They want to be out. They want to be with other people. Social media has probably changed that dynamic, which is probably something we need to be aware of as educators. The extroverts, in a way, can be extroverted all the time now via their devices. And we may have to do more to teach them how to be still and quiet and concentrate and focus on a certain assignment or something. So, you know, let's take filmmaking, for example, because mm -hmm. you teach filmmaking. Um, how does that look when an introvert would like that quiet time, like that, like that reflection time to write something. And the extrovert <laughs> is maybe, you know, being boisterous, being right. talkative, not necessarily providing that space. That might be maybe an area where tension can arise, right? Because mm. it's hard to communicate that mm -hmm. if you're an introvert or an extrovert to even be aware that that's what you're doing. How, how do you help them navigate that? Well, once they're getting older and we're doing specialized projects like movies or plays, there's choice involved. So whereas there might be an introvert who would like to be the director, which means they're going to be in charge of the class. I know it's happened before. Uh, they should have that opportunity. But if they prefer to be a lighting person or a sound person or a cinematographer where their engagement with others does not require as much social energy, so that's one way they can be accommodated is that especially when we get to that area where there are specialized jobs within drama. I mean, I do know some of the people that have done plays are probably choosing to do lighting because they can be alone in the lighting booth and do lighting. Uh, that would appeal to me. Yes. And, you know, other people, they could be extroverts, but they like lighting. 
Right. So they just, you know, so it varies, but there are opportunities. I, I think the overall goal is to create as many opportunities as we can within our curriculum and what we're trying to do uh, that would appeal to an introvert or an extrovert. And then when we can't do that, look for opportunities where choices can be involved. But in the end, also remembering that extroverts need to learn how to be still and quiet and alone Mm -hmm. because that's going to be required from them in life. And introverts need to learn skills and public speaking and and, and being in front of people and working with groups and so forth. And uh, that's a skill that they'll need to have. So it's partly about honoring where they're coming from, but also challenging them a little bit to grow in certain areas. Well, and I've appreciated uh, lots of things, but one piece that you pointed out was just the spectrum, right, mm-hmm. of introverts and the spectrum of extroverts and truly how they can overlap depending on mm-hmm. what's being asked of them or their interest level in the activity or class. Um, but I think to acknowledge that the school day is built around tip the general sense of what extroverts tend to flourish in, to build in activities that lean more towards the introvert, I think you're also helping the extroverts who have the introverted parts of them right. too, right, sure. to accommodate both. So I think I just really appreciate the idea of building activities with the design of what are what activities can lean more towards the extroverted route and what activities mm-hmm. can lean more towards the introverted route, knowing that probably most of our students are going to benefit from both of those. Exactly. And to have structured times where they know to expect it, can pr- then they're having that practice where then when we go home from school, I've done this before. I know how mm-hmm. to sit down and do homework by myself. But like you said, the social media, a lot of, if we have our phones out, computers out, we're still engaging with peers about right. homework too. But um, that element of choice, right? That we mm-hmm. have that choice to kind of practice both sides of our personality Mm-hmm. We don't feel boxed in then either right. to always be on or always be solo or always, I don't know. Those are just really, I think, points that students would very much appreciate but not always be aware of Yes, at the time during their, their, yes. during their school day. And I, I, and I think part of this is really making sure that we are distinguishing the difference between aloneness and loneliness. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I have noticed, like, for example, at recess, introverts will want to sometimes want to read a book and go off on their own. And I've heard people uh, say, you know, well, should we encourage them to make friends or something like that? And it's kind of like, well, they have had to be on all morning. They're going to have to be on all Uh afternoon. Uh Uh, We should honor this opportunity that they've had to be social. They need some time to rest and rejuvenate and read a book. By themselves. And I think that's when we need to be aware of our own lens. Yes. If we're an introvert or if we're an extrovert, because we're going to view that same scenario quite differently. Yes. Because exactly. when I see that outside at recess, I'm thinking about, I, you know, I wonder what that is, you know, what that impact is for that student. That student may very well want to have that alone time and right. feel recharged. Or there is a possibility, too, that that student wants to, you know, play with other students, but doesn't know how to initiate. So it's just being an open, it's having an open approach and an open mind to it, I think, Mm -hmm. Um, instead of just saying, well, there's a deficit there or there's a problem there. To be open to asking questions and viewing it outside of your own, like you said, Megan, comfortability level. Yeah, I think that's really important because uh, the the lens thing is important because teachers tend to be extroverts. Uh, uh, classroom teachers got into teaching because they could Performative, be... Performative, right? Yes, they got into teaching because they could be on all day. What's interesting about gifted education in particular is that our population here is a much higher population of introverts than you would find in a traditional school. I, th- I The only research I did was to look up the stats on it, and it's roughly... 75% extroverts in a typical school situation. But among gifted kids, it's pretty much 50-50. Uh, and so there is a bigger reason for us to be aware of the special needs of introversion because we have more introverts as part of our community. So I do th- – and, and, and the fact that most teachers are extroverts, I think that shows us that we need to really concentrate on – making sure we're aware of our lens and looking at the needs of introverted students. 
And there, and of course, some of us are introverts, and we need to do the opposite. We need to look through that lens and see: Are we, you know, what are we offering for the extroverts? Because if we're designing our curriculum based on our natural, just our gut feeling, our natural personality, we're going to design it differently. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for being here today and, and kind of talking through how this presents in drama and all the wonderful things that you're doing for our introvert and extroverted students and everyone in between. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to thank Jim and Jeff for sharing their knowledge and perspectives with us today. Moving forward, please consider utilizing the following three strategies in your teaching practice to help enrich the learning process for students who are introverts, extroverts, or somewhere in between. Number one, observation is key. Observe how students interact with you and their peers. How is your instructional style including the learning preferences of both extroverts and introverts? Number two, incorporate different types of instruction that resonates with introverted students, such as individual or small group problem solving, quiet time, or reflection. And number three, provide them with choices that are best suited for their preferred mode of expression. We want to thank you for joining us in this space today. Please subscribe to the Gifted Ed podcast to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Stay tuned for our next episode that continues to unpack the complexities of giftedness.